Okay, so uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the AMS MAA invite address given by Professor Linda Allen. My name is Jason Shui, and I will serve as the moderator of this talk. First, I would like to remind you this Zoom meeting is on webinar panel format, so which is a little bit different from other sessions. If you have comments uh, during the talk, please input them in chat. If you have any questions to the speaker, uh, please input them in Q&A. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Linda Allen received her PhD in 1981 at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, under the supervision of Thomas Herring. She had been a faculty member at Texas, Texas Tech University since 1982, and she received a Paul Whitfield Horn Distinguished Professorship in 2010. Linda has made a fundamental contribution to the field of mathematical biology. She has published more than 220 papers, three books, and delivered more than uh, 100 invited talks at a conference, including the AWM, SIAM, Sonia Kowalewski Lecture at ECAM 2015, which is International Congress for Industrial and Applied Mathematicians. In 2016, she has been elected as a SIAM Fellow, Without any further delay, let's uh, welcome Linda and her talk on modeling of viral zoonotic infectious disease from wildlife to human. Uh, Linda, you want the full screen? Uh, control L. Is, is that visible? Uh, it's not full screen yet. You have a kind of yes. a, you want to try uh, control L or command L. Um, oh. is, is that visible? Uh, not yet. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you want to try to share the full screen uh, or to share the desktop and, and then uh, try? Yeah, sorry about that. So we tried this, uh, this, this sharing uh, you know, before, before we start the meeting. It works well. Share screen. Let's see. Uh, Maybe I have to stop completely sharing. So, I'm sorry here about this. Um, I've got it on share screen. Okay. Uh, and I've got it on share. And it says I'm sharing my screen. Right. So then you can select the view uh, from the top. And I select the view from the top. That's right. And mode. Screen. Yeah, to the first screen. Okay, now it's the first screen. You can okay, start so, first okay, great. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. that. Go ahead, Linda. I followed the wrong thing, but thank you very much for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be here and, and to talk to you about a, a topic that I'm very excited about on zoonoses. First, I'd like to thank the AMSMA Joint Lecture Committee for inviting me to give this talk. It's, a, it's an honor. And I'd like to thank my university, Texas Tech University for the support, National Science Foundation, Fogarty International Center, and also NIMBIAS for their support on the topics uh, that I'm going to be talking about today. And also my collaborators, I've got several that I especially work closely with, it's Colleen Johnson, Rob, uh, Robert Owen, Doug Gooden, Carlton Phillips, Michelle Longley, Pauline Vandendriesch, Curtis Wesley, Bob McCormick, uh, Kadrita Nandi, and Kenise Nipa, and I'd like to thank them because they've contributed a lot. Uh, and so I'm going to, this is my, uh, uh, organization of the topics that I'm going to be covering. First of all, I'll give you some background on zoonoses. Then I'll talk about what we what I first got me into looking at uh, zoonoses was uh, orthohantavirus, and then animal to human spillover, and then some mathematical theory and examples. And uh, one other example with avian influenza, uh, which is uh, spills over to humans. And then conclude with the relationship between mathematics, zoonoses, and public health. OK, 
Okay, to give you some background on zoonoses, the term zoonoses was first used by Rudolf Virchow, a, a German pathologist who was a pioneer in cellular pathology. Actually, uh, so he discovered that actually it, it, it's, what's happening is not the organism of level, but the cellular level. But uh, he was, he's been attributed to giving the term zoonoses to the transmission of disease from animals to humans or vice versa. And actually it was between both of them. So uh, it can be transmitted from animals, non-human animals to humans or from humans also to animals. But now the term is most often used when it's transmitted from animals to humans. And so the zoonosis, that's why I'm going to be talking about it uh, because for us, that's, that's a, a very major concern. Uh, and, and generally the term, if you're going the other way from humans to animals called anthropozoonoses or reverse zoonoses. So, okay, so, and there are many emerging and re-emerging diseases as we're, we're, we're very aware of now. It's estimated that over 60% of human infectious diseases are zoonotic and of those 75% of them are, are emerging. An emerging disease or re-emerging uh, zoonosis means that it's been newly recognized or newly evolved and it's occurred previously, but shows an increase in either incidence or an expansion in geographical host or vector range. What we're gonna be talking about, or I'm gonna emphasize here is the spillover. Spillover is actually just a single event during which the pathogen is, is transferred from one species to another. According to the Centers for Disease Control website, there are eight priority zoonosis in the United States, and I've listed them here uh, and not in any special order, just from the website, there's zoonotic influenza, and the source of the animal uh, is from wild birds, a natural reservoir, it spills over into domestic poultry and then uh, possibly to, to humans. Salmonellosis is another one, it's a bacteria infection, but it's really foodborne, but it is, does come from animals. It's poultry, cattle, sheep, pigs, also interesting is also you may get salmonellosis from your pets if you have reptile pets, if you have, if you have snakes or turtles, they have uh, salmonella, salmonella in their gut, lots of it. What's now uh, uh, fever, the virus comes from mosquitoes, but birds are the reservoir and it's through the bite of mosquito that we get it. Plague, which is very, very old, but it's re-emerging and it comes also from the bites of fleas, but it's also carried, it's carried by rodents. One where they're most, mostly familiar with right now days is the emerging coronaviruses diseases. And I mentioned only the two that the, from bats, that both comes from bats, SARS, uh, coronavirus one, and MERS, uh, SARS uh, originates from bats, but it was uh, spillover into palm civets, which was amplified and then it was humans got in contact with it, that uh, palm civets. And, and for MERS also it was bats, camels, but uh, started re in 2012 and re emerged. Uh, because humans were in contact with camels, but not from the original source. And as you know, uh, COVID-19, uh, still it's out as to whether uh, the source and the uh, intermediate host too. Rabies is another one that's emerging mo mostly in uh, Asia, but uh, there's outbreaks from, can be from bats, dogs, raccoons, coyotes, and, and in more European boxes. Brucellosis is another one, bacterial infection. It comes from cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, also from wild game, if you're a hunter. Lyme disease is also a bacteria infection, but it's also a vector transmitted deer tick that feeds on mice or deer or small mammals. And so these are the ones that, that are the priority that are emerging or re-emerging that, that uh, were listed on the website. But there are many, many, many more. Some of the reasons for the increase we're seeing in zoonoses now is because there are increase in contacts with human movement, there's deforestation, climate change, large scale farming and also food processing. Another reason is that there is a change in our food preferences where we live and decrease in vaccination or maybe sanitation. Globalization has increased trade and travel. We've also had increase in vulnerable populations such as the elderly or immunocompromised compromised individuals. And so this is some of the reasons that mentioned by the Zoonosis Veteran Veterinary Manual for the reasons for these increases. So many emerging zoonoses from wild are spread from either a natural reservoir or an intermediate host, as, as I've already mentioned on some of these. For example, the, what I've studied before is, is a, a disease is called Hantavirus cardiopulmonary syndrome. It it's comes from rodents. And so that's the natural reservoir. There's many different types of uh, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. In the United States, 
uh, one of the most uh, virus that that's causes most cases is a Sonoma virus and is carried by the deer mouse and that's uh, transmitted to humans through not directly from the mouse but through their feces that's infected. Avian influenza uh, is not direct from waterfall but it's through domestic poultry through humans. And this picture that I've taken here from Nature Reviews Immunology which we're going to focus on viral zoonoses, not bacteria, but viral zoonoses. Here mentions the, the coronaviruses that I've already mentioned. And it mentions, shows that there's a, the, the reservoir host, which is in these, these cases are bats. And also, uh, here's another one, Hendra virus and Nipah virus. Uh, this comes from bats, but was spilled over to horses. And then from horses, humans became infected. Nipah virus from bats to pigs and then from to horses. And then the avian influenza viruses from and this one, the H5N1, that is of concern, just comes from the uh, ducks and geese to poultry and spills over to humans. Right now, um, these viruses right here, there's no human to human transmission. And so the concern is that there may be mutation or reassortment in the virus that it could cause uh, human, human transmission. So as I mentioned, we're going to focus on viral zoonoses. So again, to continue you a little bit more background, there are four stages that are necessary for transmission and maintenance of the virus in the reservoir host. Okay, so these are some basic, so you have to have contact exposure. Because we're talking about viruses, it has to enter the body and it has to enter this, a particular target cell. Each, each uh, virus has a unique place where they like to replicate. And for example, in antivirus, it's the uh, endothelial cells, it's a, it's a bleeding disease. So, and then after they enter that cell, they have to be able to replicate, they have to assemble them, they have to release. Enough virus has to get out so that it, it can be transmitted, whether it's aerosol, this is produced in the lungs, whether it's blood disease or blood or whatever, then we have to have to spread the contact again, and we have this cycle. Okay, but on the next slide, I'm just gonna say some of the, the factors that are important in each one of these. What I'm going to concentrate on these is an epidemic model, so it'll be contact exposure and transmission. At the within host one, level, we've looked a little bit at this, but would, would be in this level right here. So there are many, many things that, you know, when we model that we consider when we uh, make our make our model and, and for each particular uh, pathogen and host and, and, and reservoir, we have to consider what's most important. For example, in stage one is the environmental conditions, the climate seasonality, is there, are there anthropogenic disturbances if it's wildlife? What's the landscape like? What are the resources available? Does that affect uh, animals and, and uh, what are the host uh, intrinsic characteristics that make them a reservoir? What's the social structure of that popul population? What's the mobility behavior and susceptibility? Going in that within host level, the bio entry, we have, we have many better barriers before it gets to the site, physical barriers, you know, when it, if we breathe this in, we have, if we have a healthy lungs, we have mucous membranes and things like this, well, then maybe we can fight off this thing. But if not, then this makes it easier to cross that barrier. Virus compatibility has to do with the cell receptors. This is important for, for developing drugs to gain entry into a target cell. Replication, we have to look at host and viral genetics, host immune response, whether there's been prior exposure, what the nutritional status, uh, I remember hearing a talk one time that a pharma, 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 pharmacy that's saying, you know, you know, all of this, you know, sometimes isn't taken into account, but if the person eats or doesn't eat at the time, you know, whether the drug is even works. Uh, Co-infection, this is another important problem, especially of wildlife. They're infected with many, many different kinds of pathogen. How does that affect uh, the status? Does it make it better or less? The age of age, sex, reproductive status. Transmission, what's the viral load? What is the mode of viral shedding? Is it, is it uh, through saliva? Is it urine? Is, what is it? Host factors, community. What's the intra and inter-host ecological interactions? So there are many, many things as well that we consider when we're modeling. So I'm only going to talk about two of these today a little bit. Talked about, I'll talk about seasonality, which is a, a very interesting to me. And I'll also look at some ecological interactions that affect stages one and the four, because I'm looking at epidemic models. So as I mentioned, one of the things that got me interested in this is, is we were studying orthohantaviruses. Actually, you see I'm using hantavirus and orthohantavirus. Actually, it's been changed now, so the name is orthohantavirus, and I have an older slide that uses this. But uh, the natural reservoirs for orthohantavirus are rodents. And these are 
uh, uh, maintained in the reservoir animal. They're chronically infected and there's hormonal transmission generally because they interact and they fight the aggressive behavior. It's through the saliva that's transmitted between them. But to humans, what happens is it's the virus is, is in the is in, is people are exposed because they're working out in the field or they're working in a, a building where there's been rodents and they sweep things. And so the virus becomes aerosolized and they breathe it in. And so that's, so oftentimes we don't know, but it could be that, you know, I'm, you could have a, a contact with the membranes and things like that also through skin, it could also be, but the, the majority is through not direct, but through the, the, the excreta that's been infected. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is the second part where I was gonna look at, at the, the spillover among rodents. So not, not humans here, but because we have many species of rodents and why is this one rodent adapted to it? Well, it turns out uh, it does become adapted and there's a natural reservoir that harbors this particular uh, uh, strain of virus. So I worked, the, the people that I worked with was funded by uh, Florida International. Was a, we, we had a, a team that was down in, in Paraguay and some that working in the United States, but, but the team in Paraguay, led by Robert Owen, collected, uh, set up traps and field data to collect uh, data on these rodents uh, in Eastern Paraguay. So here's a map of Paraguay in South America, and it was in Eastern Paraguay. And so the, the GIS person working with us, Doug uh, uh, Gooden, got these, these images right here. So you can see the images right here, and you can see more closely here that uh, we wanted to see where we would find rodents and where we would see, you know, different rodents in different kinds of vegetation. So that was one of the goals of the proposal. So the work I'm going to talk about was published in actually a while ago. It was published in 2009, Journal Theoretical Biology. So here's the here's the data that was collected. And so it, this is it takes a I, I really admire the people that I work with because it takes a lot of effort to get all this data. Just think about oh, these were trapping data. So this is uh, time is increasing like this. And you can't see it very well, but these are nine uh, trapping sessions. And there were many traps set out. And you can see why it looks like uniform because these were the traps for and where they were, were uh, trapped. But what there is is there's this was in one site and where there was disturbance, human disturbance, meaning that there weren't, there wasn't that much vegetation, and this was not the preferred, necessarily the preferred habitat of these species. But there were three species of rodents captured. The one that we were interested in was the Acton motensis, which is the reservoir animal for an orthohonovirus named Jabora virus. Uh, this particular virus actually hasn't been known to spill over to humans, but but, but, but it does, it is a, a orthohana virus. And there were two other rodents that were captured here. And what's, what I've increased here is this picture right here and this screen right here. And so as you can see, there's three different species trapped or the size, the size of the uh, image here, the square, triangle or circle indicates how many they trapped at that site. And the little plus right here, they also had to test whether they actually had uh, the Hanna virus. And so these are just antibody levels. This is not whether it's shedding, it's antibody levels. So they've been, actually they've been, they could be, but it's been infected at some point in the past. And so you'll see, this is the reservoir. You can see it was antibody virus. And it's located kind of on this one side and mostly it's in this area right here. They do kind of separate, but you also see it in another species here that's more widely distributed in this particular area. Okay, so this is in the disturbed region that we found the overlap between all three of these species. So why is spillover important just among the wildlife species and especially in orthohonic virus because it can contribute to maintenance of the pathogen in the wild. That is, it, it could spill back. Or spillover also may be instrumental in the evolution of new viruses. So there's reasons for looking at these spillovers too. And so now here's the mathematics. So, okay, as a mathematician, then how do I model this? Well, we knew that there's, there's the habitat for these different species. We're only gonna look at two species here. There's the reservoir in our case, which is the Acodon montantis, and the other, another species, which we put the subscript S here. And so we made the traditional model that we're very familiar with. We have a susceptible rodent host, exposed, infectious, transmitting disease, and persistently infected, or can still transmit. 
But in the spillover, which this we have susceptible, we have exposed, we have acutely, not, we have acutely infected and then recovered because they don't, it's not maintained in that particular species. So they recover, but they can become acutely infected. That's why they have antibodies. And so, so when they're in their own habitat, there's generally not much overlap. But we found there is overlap when they have in some region that's not their preferred habitat. And so that's why we have this. So we have movement into this region. There's also births and deaths they have, they generate in their, their original habitat, there's births and deaths. But in this, there's not births and deaths. They just go into this region, you know, foraging or, or uh, just movement that we've seen them there. And they do have contact with each other. And so I've just labeled them a little bit differently. And so we did the, the normal things we calculate the R-naughts for the, the own habitats. And then there's the spillover. So the actual, if we consider this whole system here, which consists of uh, 16 equations here, the R-naught looks like this, this expression right here. And it's actually greater than or equal to the what would it be alone because you have this uh, contact between them and in, infectious in system. So now this is a, we, we developed some uh, differential equation models, but we also did it stochastically. And so all I'm gonna show you here is, I'm not gonna show the analysis, I'm just gonna show you what the output is in this particular model. What we wanted to do is see, to build this model to see if we could get what we were seeing in some of the data, the spillover. So what I have here is I have three pictures. You'll see the straight line across for the, the reservoir, the, this is the infectious reservoir in its reservoir habitat and uh, the, the persistent one. But then on top of that, this is what the OD solutions gives us after it goes to a, a steady state, right? We have an endemic leaving group because the overall R naught is greater than one. But you'll see there's this highly variable when you look at the stochastic simulation of that, which is a discrete, uh, random, the discrete random variables time continuous. So it's a a continuous time markup chain model. And you see the highly variable. So when you when you when we have people out, when we have our, uh, our our people who track the data, you know, if they happen to be in the right site, that they can catch this, you know, because it could be highly variable when you see this. In the boundary region where we saw that some of the overlap, again, there, this is also just the infectious, this is in the boundary region for the reservoir, where you see, you'll still see more, you should see generally more in the reservoir but it's at low levels and could be at high levels for the infectious or the persistent. So this is the spillover, okay, which it isn't generally maintained in. So this is the acutely infected one in its own habitat. You'll, so what happens is you'll see one case here, maybe one time, and you'll see one case here, one case here, sometimes two cases, but not very often, right? And that's what we're seeing. So the model does replicate what we think it should, okay? And, and so it's, it was morally just a test of the seed that we were getting, what we hoped we would get. Okay, and so in the remainder of the talk, what I'd like to do is to talk about uh, some new research that we've been interested in and in, in looking at the seasonal effects on spillover and, and looking at human spillover. So this is a nice picture from The Lancet in 2012, which kind of illustrates some of the things that we're interested in. And see this wave, right? So this is the, the seasonality uh, that we've seen in, in number of cases in the wildlife. Okay, now it could be anything, it could be, uh, you know, but here the picture is a uh, primate here. Could be rodents, could be bats, but you see this, this periodicity maybe in the wildlife, but there's this could be a spillover from the wildlife to an intermediate host, or could be from the wildlife to humans. In this particular case, it was a bad case because it was amplified in humans or amplified in domestic animals. Okay, but we're looking at, we're interested in this, the seasonality. So I'm only interested in the spillover, a single event with spillover. That's what I'm going to do with seasonality. So what we did was we we're, we're just testing out this concept. So we have a SIR compartmental diagram that depicts seasonality. Okay, that will just depict seasonality. So here's the model just schematically. So we have uh, susceptible, infectious, and recovered. And you notice what the difference is, is instead of these parameters being fixed, okay, the transmission rate from animal to animal is time dependent. So we have this non-autonomous system. We were looking at an ODE. And it could be that the, and if it's a migration, and if it's the, the wild waterfall that's migrating, it's this, they congregate together when they're migrating, maybe and there's more uh, likelihood that a disease if present in one would be transmitted to another. And seasonality also affects, affects recovery rate. 
could recover. And so also animal to human transmission. Here's the spillover, which is this dashed line right here that occurs from the animal resource to the human. Okay, and also that is time dependent. Okay, so it depends on the season. And this is work that's in review. And so I'll show you what the, so this is, this is a starting from a simple case, okay? We're looking at an animal reservoir, okay? And so this is what the uh, equations would look like if it was an ODE model. We have this time dependent here. This is transmission recovery. And the human, since we're only interested in the first spillover event from animal to human, I'm not going to model whether it's transmitted from human to human. That would be another thing. Very interesting to if it can be transmitted, transmitted, but that probably has to mutate if we're looking at certain things, okay? Or if it's already been adapted, then we would have human to human spillover. So we're only looking at the first spillover. And so here we're going to assume that there's seasonality. So there's periodicity. So these parameters are periodic. So this is a simple case. So the amplitude will change, may change. This could be uh, different. Um, this is for I equal A, H. This is for, should be G here, but could be different. Okay, but I'm making the same type, but it could be, uh, the amplitude could be positive. Uh, I mean, it could be, could be different. Okay. Okay, so here I'm giving also, we're doing a, a, a stochastic process. Oh, it's time non-homogeneous stochastic spillover that we include the infection recovery process. So what happens is, is the, the random variables are discrete valued. And the transition probabilities we're looking at until the first human spillover. So if there is an animal infection, okay, we have a new infection here. This occurs with this particular probability. Or if there's a animal recovery, it occurs with this probability. Or if there's a human infection, okay. And so we're going to simulate this uh, using these probabilities here, one of these three or nothing, okay. So the initial conditions are very important. So what do we do when we start at a particular time during this season, right? The length of the season is T. At a particular time, we introduce I infected animals. Okay, and there's N minus A minus I susceptible, but there's no infection in the human. Okay, so we're gonna run, we're gonna be interested when that first instance of spillover occurs. Okay, so just to show you what happens in the stochastic process, so you know, okay, so the time of the year that an animal infected is introduced changes the probability of a spillover. The year is divided, in this case, the example is four seasons. So the period is four. I'm showing you five sample paths below where either the infected animal is introduced at the beginning of the year at time equals zero or one uh, after one season one fourth of the year way in, but we only add one infected animal into that. Okay, so here's an example. So we have periodic recovery, animal to animal human and animal to human transmission. And by these three figures here, okay, this is just theoretical, just to show you what happens. So here's the, the recovery rate and it's periodic a minute. And, and here's the animal to human transmission and animal to animal. So they're the same, but the transmission is a little bit and the recovery rate is a little bit different. Okay, so what we're doing is we're going to introduce an infection, one infected animal, either at time zero or time one. So I introduce it at time zero, and then I look at it, what happens, and five, five, I run the simulation five times just so what happens. Okay, so what you'll see of the animal infected, we're graphing the infected animals here. So in, the, in that five different simulations, you'll see five uh, paths here, four of them are stopped at a certain time because they stopped because I ran it until there was a spillover. At this particular time here, at this particular time here, this time, this time, there was a human that became infected. And there was one time the animal recovered with that nothing happening, okay? In another case, we run it again. Now we introduce the animal at time one. In this case, it was different animal to animal, animal to human in, in recovery rates. In this particular instance, those five simulations, four of them, nothing resulted in human spillover. One of them did. The animal had a spillover and so it had a human infection. And you can see it's quite different. The probability of a spillover here is much larger than it is here, which you might expect if you looked at this over here, because at time equals zero, animal to animal transmission is higher, this is higher. But the rate of recovery, I mean, the rate of, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the rate of recovery is lower, so that the, the period of, is, um, uh, 
uh, is low. So that means they're uh, uh, infectious for a longer period of time. Okay, whereas in this pipe here, the, the, the period at which they're infected is lower and also the, uh, they're, they're infected for a shorter period of time. And the, the rates at which they're becoming infected are lower. So you'd expect that, okay? So that's what we're looking at. So how do I do this? So here's some of the mathematical theory, which I'll, I'll summarize. So what we look is at, we look at the, at, we're interested in that first spillover when we introduced an infected into the animal population. We run it until either there's zero infectives left or a spillover occurs. One of those two has to happen. So we use generating functions uh, in stochastic processes, and we use the assumption of independence at the beginning. Why, why is that reasonable? That's reasonable because when there's just a few, uh, the density pins are nothing, nothing's going to affect it as, as much. See, when we have to test this too when we run the program. But. Okay, so here we denote the pro we denote, a, denote a transition probability here, the probability that I infected animals introduced at time t naught will infect K, animal, K animals, but there's no humans infected. So this is the transmission uh, probability. If have I infected animals at time T naught, and there's now K infected animals at time T, but during that time, there's no humans, animal, humans infected. Okay, we write the generating function for that, which is all the possible uh, number of infections you, you could, how many animals you could get infected without getting human infected uh, from up k, sum them all up, and our generating function looks like this. If we evaluate this at u equals zero, this dummy variable here, u equals zero, we just get the first term in this, which is the probability that I start with the i and I don't have uh, any human infections and the infection dies out. Okay? Since we're assuming independence, it turns out this is, we're assuming these, these generating functions here because we're starting at, uh, we're doing a branching process approximation. We're only doing it, we're assuming it's breath at disease free equilibrium make some simplifying assumptions. And it turns out whether you start with I infected, it's the same as starting with one infected and raising it to the i power. Okay, that's an assumption, okay? So uh, showing just a little bit more of the mathematics, if we use the backward Kolmogorov differential equation for this transition probability, we can get an estimate for the probability of no spillover. Okay, so we can derive this equation right here that depends on the animal to animal recovery and animal to human transmission. And it also depends on this, gener this generating function right here. But notice this has, uh, it's nonlinear, it has this p square here. It also has this on the denominator. Okay, so you're conditioning on not having an animal to human transmission. That's why this is on the denominator here. So you solve this equation right here. It's a backward equation. So we make a change of variable, t minus t naught. We fix t, so it's only a function of t naught. So this is an ODE. Solve it, and because these are periodic, we get a periodic function. Okay, in the limit, it converges to a periodic. So the asymptotic probability of no spillover is found from solving this, finding this solution right here, and so it's it's this equation right here. So it's it looks like this. You have to make a change of variable because we're going backward in time. So this is the probability of no spillover. So if we know the probability of no spillover, it's really easy to calculate the probability of a spillover. So the probability of a spillover from the theory says, this should be approximately one minus the probability of no spillover when you have I infected animals. Okay, I'll just show you some, some of the simulations, what happens when for our model now. We also define two B, two reproduction numbers. One, you're very familiar with it. If you've done some epidemic modeling, this is the uh, basic reproduction number for the animal reservoir, which is the transmission rate divided by the recovery rate. But this is using the average of the parameters and for spillover infection in humans. I'm going to define that as the animal to human over the length of time that that animal is infectious. Okay, these averages. Okay, so here's one's the interesting thing. So if you don't have any senescinality, it turns out these, and I'm assuming my parameters are all at their average value, so there's no seasonality here. It turns out you can easily calculate the asymptotic probability of spillover from the backward equation. Okay, it's a fixed point, okay? 
you can calculate it. And, and, it, and I've graphed what it is here for different values of these two quantities here, the, the reproduction number for the animal reservoir and the animal to human spillover. And as you'd expect, if you increase both of those, you increase the probability of spillover. And the trans, even if, even if that animal to animal um, spillover is less than one, so their basic reproduction error is less than one, you could still have a spillover to humans. It depends on what the animal to human contact rate is, right? So as it increases, you also increase that. So it's very important. This was also shown based by Singh and Ong's physical review in 2014. So it actually looks just exactly like the, their paper. So I'm gonna show you some simulations. So I'm gonna show some uh, uh, assumptions about parameter values. So we have a periodic probability of spillover study computationally for seven different, uh, several different uh, parameter values. Okay, so I'm going to assume like that one example I did that the season is four seasons. I'm going to change the amplitude of that seasonality. Okay, and I'm gonna use these cosine functions. In these particular examples, the average values of animal, animal tr transmission, animal to human and, and recovery are, are given by these values right here. So this is less than one, this is less than one. Okay, and I'm using these cosine functions. Okay, the population sizes are, are a relatively large thousand. I'm going to make. Okay, so I'm going to show you what happens. Okay, so I'm told this is a busy slide. So <laughs> let me try to explain what's shown here. So I'm just showing you trying to understand what's happening when we have seasonality in these parameters. It's computed using the branching process approximation, but it's checked with simulations of the Markov chain. The, the time non-homogeneous stochastic process, which is nonlinear. So the branching process approximation is used because I can get a periodic probability of the spillover. So what's on the left is the assumptions that were made about all three of those, those parameters, gamma, animal, animal, and animal to human on the left. And I did four different cases here, okay? In the middle slide, so you start at a time, t, this is my initial conditions, so I'm starting at time zero, time two. I'm start looking at what happens when, what's the probability of spillover when I start at different times, if I start with one infected animal or I start with five infected animals. This is this column right here. So the first case is interesting. So what it says is, suppose the shapes of all three parameters, okay, they have different averages, okay, but their shapes are all the same. They all have the low points high, but their shapes, right, okay? So if you look at the R, the basic reproduction, those rough reproduction numbers that I defined, when you take the ratios of those, they're constant. And it turns out the probability of a spillover, no matter what time of year I start, the zero, if I start at the first part of the year, in the middle, middle of the year, the probability of a spillover occurring for these particular parameter values, even if they're seasonal, is 25%. If I start with five, it's, it's this amount. It's constant no matter what, even if their seasonality, as long as they're exactly the same. I mean, they're, 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 shape, they're going the same. There's reason you can see from the equations from doing that because it's easy to show. Okay, and I'll look at this one here. You can, and the reason I chose these is because, you know, you have these totally, depending on what recovery is in relation to the other ones, you get totally different probability of a spillover occurrence. Okay, so in this one right here is what I showed you uh, in the examples, which is showing the sample pass. So if you start at time equals zero, that part of the year, animal to animal transmission, animal to human is, is, is at its peak and the recovery rate, the rate is very slow. So they're infected for a long period of time. This is the highest probability that you have a spillover, very close to one. If you just go at one, okay, it goes down a lot. Two, even lower. Okay, and what are these little blue circles on here? Because this curve right here that we're, this curve right here was from the, solving the backward Kolmogorov equation, okay, over time. And these were running the Markov chain, the time non-homogeneous stochastic process to see that it was, see that this estimate was good. 
So 10,000 sample pass I ran and looked at the proportion of times that there was a spillover and, and, and recorded that and that's what this circle is. So it's spot on, okay? So it works. The approximation worked for this particular example, okay? But interesting, it's not exactly the same as these things right here and so it depends. And so the peak, the, the, where you think that the, the peak might be the best, the highest, uh, well, okay. It's not, it doesn't occur right when you think it would be. It's shifted a little bit. It's because things are happening. Things are changing over time. Okay. And just to show you that it's, 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 it's important to look at the whole spectrum of what's happening at the different times. If suppose I average that periodic probability of spillover. I took the, the average of that black curve generated from the branching process. And I computed that and compared with just assuming that the parameters were kept at their average. And how does that compare? It isn't the same. It's not the same. In case A, they're fixed, okay? But the average probability of spillover is higher in case B than it would be if it was just at its average. Higher, and then it gets lower here. But if you start with five, it's even different, okay? It's lower here. If you had five, it's lower probability of a spiller, but it's certainly higher than if you started out with one. Okay, so it's not, it's, it's not easy to predict just by looking at, it's not easy to predict just by looking at these curves to predict what this is going to look like. But I also should say, so looking at the time at the, the spillover curves, this is, this picture right here is from that last example, but looking at not just probability, but the time that the spillover occurs and the, and, and the standard deviation of that spillover. So this is when there was a constant probability of spillover, this case A. But as you can imagine, right in the middle, when it, the probability, when the, the transmission rates were low and the recovery rates were high, so you were infectious for just a short period of time, it took a longer time for that 25% of the population to get, I mean, 25% that they would get spillover takes a much longer time. So the timing is variable, even though the probability is fixed. Okay, and this makes it much more, if you try to control to prevent these spillovers, uh, it makes it very hard because you're gonna change that timing of the spillover rate. It's not, doesn't occur immediately, it occurs after uh, what you think it would be. And the last example I'm just going to mention to show you some other figures. I don't have much time, so. Uh, this is just another it's an example where I took uh, to use the literature and use some of the data that's from the literature for avian influenza. So I'm looking at actually looking at poultry and um, transmission to humans spillover. And um, avian influenza, there's many uh, hemoglobin, many hum, hem, it's classified by surface proteins. And when we talk about highly pathogenic avian influenza, we're talking about uh, it's a uh, high mortality rate in the domestic poultry or in the, the, the poultry population. Um, and so that's how we recognize it. So that's a very much concern. And just to show you some more data, this is from the World Organization of Animal Health. You can see all they're recording is the number of outbreaks in domestic birds. And you can see it occurs annually, very high annually. This is worldwide. So the seasonality is present here. And so here, you can see we can we add births and or, or, uh, uh, replacement of the, the domestic birds uh, and, and removal of the domestic birds. There's natural, there's high mortality here, not recovery. Okay, and um, and then in humans. So here I'm only going to look at animal animal and then and then these these other parameters here. So I did not recovery is time dependent. These are time dependent. So you start at the disease free equilibrium. Um, I took parameters and modified them a little bit to show, to just emphasize some of the things. This was from uh, one of my, uh, from uh, MC Tunsura and then Maya Marchivo, which are, well, they fit uh, data from um, cumulative number of human cases to, the, to get parameters. But I changed some of these to, so they were making them a little bit smaller and made this a little bit larger. And so now you can still do the same analysis, even though you have, you have births and deaths in here and I assume some assumptions about the periodicity of the animal to animal, animal to human assumptions. This was an original uh, uh, paper 
So the result, not much amplitude. What happens if there's an increase in amplitude in the animal to animal transmission in both of them? Okay, and so you can see there's a different uh, fit data fit to that. So just showing you uh, again. So here's the, the there's the parameters that are periodic. Okay, and the, the simple case where it's not much ample, not much seasonality. Uh, you can see this is the estimate from the branching process. And then these little circles here, every one of these is 10,000 simulations, uh, and then counting the, the proportion of times there was a spillover. And again, the, what's it saying is that this estimate is, uh, the estimate from the branching process is very good to, to do that. And when you have animal, animal that's seasonal, but not animal to human, you still get, you get some seasonality. But if both of them, and so animal to human, so when the contacts are also animal to human, are also seasonal and of the same form, you get this much, uh, you get this big dip. So it's when these are very low, these transmission are very low, you get low here. And if you, if you calculate the average of these versus just straight on, actually, there's a lower probability of spillover when you have the seasonality, although the averages are the same in all these cases. Okay. But anyway, that, that, there's so many more questions that need to be addressed. We need we need data. We need to know where this what what's what's driving the seasonality. Model it correctly. So I just want to end up okay with motivation for a lot more people to look at this that are know a lot about some of these particular diseases and have also maybe looked at seasonality. But to help us understand the mathematical models do help us understand the effects of multiple species, multiple well multiple pathogens, host, direct and indirect transmission environmental conditions on wildlife zoonoses. Questions I think that need to be addressed about zoonoses with models and data are what's the effect of control measures that target the reservoir that intermediate the host. This becomes really hard when you have, you know, when you inter introduce a control measure when, when things are changing, whether it's culling, which is often occurs with the poultry or vaccination and the effect of climate change on zoonotic disease. We know this is, if, especially vector-borne diseases, we know this is affecting vectors. We see uh, that's why Lyme disease is, 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 is uh, um, increasing too, because of the increase in the range of the vectors. And what is the effect of travel restrictions, trade regulations, and sanitation measures on, on control and prevention? Because it may not be the wildlife that's actually transmitting the avian influenza. It could be the trade in the poultry that's been hypothesized. So there's many, many, many questions. Anyway, so zoonosis and public health safety require collaboration, cooperation, education. The One Health Initiative has the acronym coordinating, communicating, collaborating. But I want to, I think it's cooperation and education, maybe too. So between experts in biology, ecology, wildlife, virology, geography, epidemiology, veterinary medicine, public health, statistics, computation methods. Cooperation Cooperation, coordination within and between agencies, academic, medical, government, local, national, and international. This is one health initiative. But education, we need to tell, be, let people know about zoonoses and, and just be aware of them, not fear, but just know about them, the sources and methods of threat and appropriate preventive measures. So I thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, I'd be glad to answer any questions. I'm sorry, I, I go fast. I'm really excited about this, so I'd, I'd be glad to you know, address your questions if I can. Or yes. so, thank you. Thank you, Linda, for your wonderful talk, which is very informative. They do have several questions uh, in Q and A, so which I will pass to you. Uh, and, and and in the meantime, uh, if people would like to ask questions verbally, you can click the button, uh, raise a hand between chat and Q and A. We're going to pass microphone to you virtually, so you can ask uh, you know the question directly to Linda. Uh, the first question, uh, Linda, uh, in the Q and A is: Does the particular reservoir host imply anything about either the impact of virus, its transmissibility, or its or its mutation rate? Oh, I definitely, I think so. I think that's true. Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, well, for, well, for ortho, I mean, rodents, I mean, there's, yeah, so there's often the, the most frequent reservoir hosts are rodents and bats, but there's also uh, birds, okay? And they maintain, they're able to, bats are able to maintain it uh, for, you know, for long periods of time. 
I mean, and they, and they carry many different things. Okay, but but it's interesting that they're not the, except in special cases, they're not the the human contact. It's with they have contact with other things. But but I think it's I think it's the because they have they have they have est they it's because of uh, yes it's because of their uh, particular life cycle that they're able to maintain it right I mean they uh, they have a quiescent and period they're, they they come out during certain times in 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 Hendra virus too uh, they uh, it was bats that were feeding the fruit bats were feeding the horses were underneath there. Eating and, and eating at the same place, and then the, the the horses got it right. And this also with the palm civets. Bats were eating some fruits that the palm civets ate the same thing, and 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 then it was actually from it's 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 interesting how it's transmitted. But it does certainly represent the that depends on the reservoir host, how it's maintained, and that that particular one. It's not like for rodents that they maybe have uh, evolved uh, in some in some way so that they can maintain the, the infection without mortality, right? And so it has to be evolved in that particular host. Bats have been around a long time, but it's been around a long time. I see, thank you. Uh, that's a related to a second question. Is there any information on hunter virus outbreak in pet yeah. rodent species and they are spread to human? Yes, yeah, this is very interesting. I went to a meeting on hunter virus one time and, stuff, and they were showing where I don't, I don't remember what country it was, and I probably should mention. But people had pet rats, and it was that the, it was actually the, yes, it was transmitted from their pet rat to the humans. Yes, uh, because they would they would fondle them and they would kiss the rats. I mean, they love their pets, right? So this is a, not a good thing to do. I don't think so. It, you got to be careful. But it wasn't. I mean, they weren't they weren't aware that they had hunter virus, but it was traced back to a source of pet store that sold the rats yeah but i bet people sell rats if you have snakes too right so that but yeah so yes there is there is cases of hunter virus outbreaks in humans uh traced back to pet rodents right thank you linda so uh, i think ji shi huang asked uh do we have a good resource uh, kind of source link to educate ourselves about uh, this uh, zoonotic kind of disease oh there's so many so I, yeah i would think I think maybe the first sources maybe go to some of the centers for disease, the centers for con disease control, right? And then if you're interested in a particular one, it's just there's so much available, right? You just click on what kind of thing you, that you're interested in. Uh, you know, if you're an avian influenza, if you're into hunter viruses, if you're interested in, in Lyme disease, and uh, yeah, but CDC has uh, so a good place just to educate yourself on that. There are also many books I've read. Some of them are very interesting <laughs> texts that are popular books that are very very interesting to read too i see i could give you a yeah um i don't have them this, i don't have them right here but cdc might be a good place i see yeah maybe this year could email you uh with uh with yeah if you my uh, uh yeah my my yeah uh my email is linda i could put it in the chat i guess i could put it in the chat all right uh, also, uh, he, I think he or she will follow up. Uh, what's your advice uh, to people who actively uh, go go to the go to the field to protect themselves? Uh, you know, get infected from uh, potential any kind of virus, kind of disease, infection. Um, okay, so so you know the people that that I work with in Hanna virus, they actually, when they work with the rodents, they do wear protective gear, right? Because they're working with the animals that they know are potentially infected. I think you just have to be aware, right? If you see, uh, I go out in the wild a lot, okay? And I don't particularly worry unless I see, you know, there's a more rodents than usual. Some years you see more rodents than usual and right deer mice I know carry certain things. So <laughs> sometimes we have some, they like to make nests. And so you just have to be aware, but you don't handle these things, right? It's handling these things. And now if you're, in general, most like in Hanavirus, many of the things that are contracted are when it's in a building, when it's enclosed, when you might breathe it in. But if you're outdoors, you have much, much less chance of getting it. And, and, you know, people, I think, I think, you know, even with rabies, I think in the United States, more of it is a fear 
of getting, you know, that you might have gotten exposed, but uh, it's, not as, it's not as common as what you think. But I think it's also being aware of, you know, where you've been if you do get sick and always getting help in case you do get sick, which I don't think you have to wear. I mean, uh, I worry about rattlesnakes. <laughs> so I, I wear protection so that I don't get bit by a rattlesnake. <laughs> I think that's more of a danger for me. But yeah, I mean, I think being aware of the sources of infection and um, not handling animals. And certainly if you see a dead animal, you'll see signs too if you walk through a, a tunnel because of bats, that the bats do carry rabies. You, you know, you should carry, you should cover, if you go through a with guano on that, that uh, roost there, you should, you need to have covering over your mouth and uh, don't touch anything. So that's a precaution that anybody should take, right? Yeah, thank you, Linda. So we can see uh, definitely your talk generated a lot of interest. There's uh, another question uh, by Barbara uh, Margolius, and she asked, could you provide a reference for your work using generating function to analysis periodic and seasonal process? So uh, you might already done so, but uh, she might miss that. So do you have okay, a reference? So, so I, I don't know if you can still see my screen or not. Okay. This, so it's in this last one, it's actually under this talking about seasonal variation, but there is a new, there's a publication that just appeared in Bulletin of Math Biology that looks at seasonal variation, but this is looking not at spillover, right? It's looking at just probability of an outbreak that's seasonal. Okay, this will be out soon, and if you send me an email, I'll be glad. If it's accepted, I'll be glad to, to forward it to you. Mm -hmm. But but I can give you other references, yeah. And uh, some of these other references, I'll be glad to give you. Uh, like Singh has a very nice paper. Uh, there's one other one, Wanson, who is looking at uh, branching processes. I can give you some of those references, uh, Barbara. Uh, so if you can send me an email, I'd be glad to uh, give you a list of references. Would that if that's helpful? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. So um, uh, due to the time, so maybe, uh, uh, you know, please join me again uh, to thank Linda for, for her uh, wonderful talk. And, um, you know, and also thank you all for joining us today. Thank you.